Hello, welcome back, ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls, Christians, non Christians alike. Welcome. We're here to continue our study on the seven seals, right? We're doing part two of seal number three, right? Now, as customary, let's ask our question. And this question is more personal and interactive. And it says, what is your most difficult passage to understand? So what you'll do is that you'll share your thoughts in the comment section below. So type in the comments your most difficult passages. And who knows, maybe in the future, right, I'll do a video I'm addressing these difficult to understand passages. Now, before we get into our third seal study, part two, let us pray and ask the presence of God to be with us. Most kind, ever loving Father and our God. As we come before you once more to look at your words, Father, give us clear insights. Father, give us the message that you would have wanted to convey. Father, let us be transformed and changed by this message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And as we were saying, the third seal, part two, um, let's recap what we did in the last study. Um, in the last study, we look at the symbols under the third seal. And we recognize that ours symbolize church, as always. Black is moral and spiritual darkness, right? That we call apostasy, right? The rider and the black horse was God. Balance is, is used to judge. We look at that. Famine for the word, right? We see that's what the symbol um food where it was broken down to be right we recognize that oil is a symbol of the holy spirit and we looked at that wine is a symbol of christ salvation so that was what we learned from the symbols um last study of the third seal now the time period of the third seal we did not mention that in our last study right that's the first issue now um, that we want to look at in our presentation today now ad 313 to the 1500s right this is the time period right that the third seal covered now you ask why and it's because of this right the edict of milan which we look at under the second the close of the second seal and um, we entered it the last time right the edict of milan was signed in 313 ad between licinius and constantine and this bring toleration for the christians so this bring an end to right the second seal persecutions mentioned in the second seal right so this was a start 313 ad was a start of the third hours period right and it was ended in the 1500s right and it was ended with the start of the protestant reformation and why the protestant reformation is because the protestant reformation where it was seeking to bring back some legitimacy or bring back the church to the place it was in the apostolic times Right, and so when the apostasy of the third seal, right, would have been reformed, right, it's at this time then the the third or period would have ended, right, and so that's why we we look at the timeline being three thirteen A.D. to five fifteen hundred A.D. Right, so let's go forward some more. Now the apostle Paul talking to the church at Thessalonica in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 right this passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 it talks primarily about the anti-christian power what we call the antichrist and so when we have gone through 2 Thessalonians 2 when we have gone through our study today 
without a shadow of a doubt you will be able to identify which system is the antichrist system let us go verse 3 let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he as God seated in the temple of God showing himself that he is God for the mystery of iniquity doth already work only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way so this is letting us know that before the full establishment of the antichrist power there would have been a falling away from the pure teachings the pure doctrines of the church as was held in the apostolic times right so this is what we see and in the third seal period of the church this is exactly what we see we see the falling away of the teachings and the practice of the early church taught by Jesus and his disciples right so according to 2 Thessalonians 2 right, the Antichrist power was now developing in the church right in the, the third seal period it developed rapidly right but the Apostle Paul mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2 right that the anti-Christian power right was at work already in his time now a lot of persons think antichrist mean opposed to christ right but that's only one definition of antichrist the second definition of antichrist is one who put himself in the place of christ so the two definition one oppose christ two put oneself right in the place of christ Right, what were the fruits of Satan hijacking of the church? Now, the third horse period, right, 313 AD, remember we said it started in the time of Constantine, right, and this is what it says. I'm going to be reading from the Great Controversy, chapter 3, The Great Apostasy. And this was a book written by one Ellen G. White, and it says, little by little at first in stealth and silence and then more openly as it increased in strength and gained control of the minds of men the mystery of iniquity carried forward its deceptive and blasphemous work almost imperceptibly the customs of Edenism found their way into the Christian church the spirit of compromise and conformity was restrained for a time by the fierce persecution which the church endured under paganism but as persecution ceased and christianity entered the courts and palaces of kings she laid aside the humble simplicity of christ and his apostles for the pomp and pride of pagan priests and rulers and in the place of the requirements of god she substituted human theories and traditions the nominal conversion of constantine in the early part of the third the fourth century caused great rejoicing and the world cloaked with a form of righteousness walked into the church now the work of corruption rapidly progressed paganism while appearing to be vanquished become the conqueror her spirit controlled the church her doctrine ceremonies and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the prophets followers of Christ this compromise between paganism and Christianity result in the development of the man of sin foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalt himself above God right so this was what happened in the time of Constantine Right? One of the first things that happened, right, and even before the time of Constantine, right, was the changing of the Sabbath day of rest. Now, if we look on our screen, we see Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11, which talks about the Sabbath, the fourth commandment. And it says this, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou art thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and allowed it. So this was the fourth commandment. It says, Remember the seventh day. And the seventh day, Saturday, this was the day on which the apostles worshiped. This was the day on which Christ worshiped, right, according to the fourth commandment. The church at Rome and the church in Alexandria, Egypt, they adopted the day of the sun, right, which we call Sunday. And this started to happen from as early as the second to the third century. Right? This was when the church at Rome and the church at Alexandria started to worship instead of the seventh day Saturday, they start to worship on the first day um, Sunday. AD 321. Why important? Right? In AD 321, right, as we know, the Emperor Constantine right, made a decree. A Sunday rest decree and he says all judges and city people and the craftsmen should rest upon the venerable day of the sun country people however may freely attend to the cultivation of the fields because it frequently happen right that no other day are better adapted for planting the grain in the furrows and the vines in trenches so that the advantage given by heavenly providence may not for the occasion of a short time perish this was constantine right decree right that those in the cities they should rest on the venerable day of the sun while it was not so much a religious uh, requirement at 321 it would later on become right a religious requirement now it says this the sunday law was officially confirmed right so they later on after constantine there was a sunday law that people should rest on the first day of the week as opposed to the seventh day of the week right notice what it says the Sunday law was officially confirmed by the Roman papacy. The Council of Laodicea in AD 364 decree, Christian shall not Judaize and be idle on the Saturday, but shall work on that day. But the Lord's day they shall especially honor, and as being Christians, shall if possible do no work on that day. If however they are found Judaizing, they shall be shut out from Christ. Right? So this was what happened AD 364 in the Council of Laodicea and they recognized that the, the primary reason for the Christian church at Rome right turning away from the seventh day Sabbath to the first day Sabbath was because they want to look different or feel different from the Jews remember in the time of Christ and the apostles they were all Jews and God had commanded worship on the seventh day so because the church at Rome realized that those who were worshipped on the seventh day were seem peculiar, right? They were seem strange, they were persecuted. So the church, trying to distance itself from the Jews, decided, well, let's just outlaw the worship of the seventh day because it's Jewish, right? And we just worship on the first day of the week, right? And because of that, they turn away from God's seventh day Sabbath, God's full commandment to the first day of the week, Sunday. And then the, in 364 they command everyone to do the same now i want to share a little the roman catholic church right it says this which is the sabbath day saturday 
is the Sabbath day. Right? This is the Roman church. You know? What I'm reading now is from the Converts Catechism of the Catholic Church. And it says this, which is the Sabbath day. Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea right, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Why did the Catholic Church substitute Sunday for Saturday? The Church substitutes Sunday for Saturday because Christ rose from the dead on Sunday and the Holy Ghost descended upon the apostles on a Sunday. By what authority did the church substitute Sunday for Saturday? It says the church substitute Sunday for Saturday by the plentitude of that divine power which Jesus bestowed upon her. And then it goes on to say, what does the third commandment command? The third commandment command us to sanctify Sunday as the Lord's day. And there's a problem here. If you notice, this says the third commandment. But what we read in Exodus 20 is actually the fourth commandment. Right? And he asks the question, how comes? And the simple answer is that idolatry was one of the things that come into the church. So the Roman Catholic Church removed the second commandment. And so the fourth commandment that says, remember the Sabbath day, actually become the third commandment. And that's why in their converse catechism, in their teachings, in their version of Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment become the third commandment. Now, let's go forward. Um, the next doctrine, or the next teaching of the church that was affected because of all the apostasy that was coming into the church from this anti-Christian power at Rome, right? Baptism. If you read in Acts chapter 8, verse 37 to 39, it states, and Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. Right? So this was how baptism was done in the early church. It was done by immersion. That's why they had to go down in the water. Right? The Apostle John baptized immersion. All through the, the apostolic period, baptism was by immersion. But when the apostasy started to come into the church, you recognize that infant baptism comes in, right? Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, right? That those who were supposed to be baptized, they should be taught the principles of the church. And they were to be taught about Christ. Now, an infant cannot be taught the principles of the church or agree to follow the principles of the church because an infant does not have the mental capacity to, right? So infants should not be baptized, but in the earliest times in the church, it's taught to baptize infant. It says the earliest explicit mention of infant baptism in the history of the church is from the African church father Tertullian, who lived from AD 160 to about 220. He was born in Cottage, studied in Rome for a legal career, and was converted to Christianity in about 195. He was the first Christian theologian to write in Latin and exert significant influence through his apologetic work. So Tertullian was the first person right, to talk about infant baptism, and he talked about this um, early right and so it was in in the, from those times you recognize that infant baptism was being practiced um in the church now another method that comes into the church right that takes the place of the biblical baptism was sprinkling right and it says during the 13th century aquinas noted that immersion was even more common than sprinkling 
It was not until 313 AD in Ravenna that the first law passed making sprinkling an authoritative baptism. Right? So even up to the 1300, right, baptism by immersion was, was prominent, still prominent. But sprinkling started to be practiced in 1311 AD. Now, when I look at the word baptism, for instance, baptism cannot be anything else but by immersion, right? Baptism is from the Greek word baptizo, right? Which means to be immersed in water. That's all it means, right? Baptism can only be by immersion, but we recognize that infant baptism had come in, which um, sprinkling had come in, right? And now we recognize that even pouring right comes into the church where person pour water on someone's head and for them to be baptized you sprinkling they sprinkle water on someone and they are baptized so these forms of baptism right comes in and and corrupted and what baptism was supposed to be and what it was in the time of the apostolic church now another part of the prophecy that we see mentioned is actually the famine for the word of god right how did this famine for the word of god actually take place um let's look in daniel chapter 8 verse 10 to 12 the scripture says this talking about the same anti-christian power anti-christ power called the little one which as we go forward we recognize what power this is right this little arm power is the same power that thinks to change the sabbath that thinks to change the commandment right it's the same power the same one that brings in infant baptism that still practice it sprinkling and pouring it's the same power right the same antichrist power that is changing everything about the church verse 10 says and it works great talking about the antichrist even to the host of heaven and he cast down some of the hosts of the stars to the ground and stomp upon them yea he magnified himself even to the prince of the host and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast on and an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression and he cast on the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospered. Now, verse 12 is what I want to zoom in on. Because in verse 12, it says that this anti Christian power it cast down the truth to the ground. When you read through the scripture, recognize that there are various things that the Bible mentions as being the truth. And one of which is John 17 17 which says sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth and so what this is telling me is that the anti-christian power right would cast down the bible to the ground in other words it would aim to destroy the bible and destroy the influence of the bible right but how did this take place right we're gonna read again from the great controversy chapter 3 right the great apostasy and by now you might recognize that the anti-christian power the antichrist power that i'm talking about is actually the church at rome right or what we know today as the papacy so satan well know that the holy scriptures would enable men to discern his deceptions and withstand his power it was by the word that even the savior of the world had resisted his attacks at every assault, Christ presents the shield of eternal truth, saying, It is written. To every suggestion of the adversary, he opposed the wisdom and power of the world. In order for Satan to maintain his sway over men and establish the authority of the papal usurper, he must keep them in ignorance of the scriptures. The Bible would exalt God and place finite men in their true position. Therefore, its sacred truth must be concealed and suppressed. This logic was adopted by the Roman Church. For hundreds of years, the circulation of the Bible was prohibited. The people were forbidden to read it, 
are to have it in their houses. An unprincipled priest and prelates interpret its teachings to sustain their pretensions. Thus, the Pope came to be almost universally acknowledged as the vicegerent of God on earth, endowed with authority over church and state. I'm going to be reading from a website called White, White Horse Media. Right? And White Horse Media also have a YouTube channel, so you can go on it um, and you can learn a lot of information about Bible prophecy and Bible history. At the Council of Toulouse, 1229 AD, papal church leaders ruled, we prohibit laymen possessing copies of the Old and New Testament. We forbid them more severely to have the above book in their popular vernacular. The lords of the district shall carefully seek out the heretics in dwellings, ovals, and forests and even their underground retreat shall be entirely wiped out. This was from Pope Gregory IX, 1229. Right? Then he says, The Roman Catholic Council of Tarragona also ruled that no one may possess the books of the Old and New Testament in the Roman language. And if anyone possess them, he must turn them over to the local bishop within eight days after the promulgation of his of this decree so that they may be burned right the council of trent 1545 to 1564 put the bible right as a as a forbidden book one of the ways that they, they tried to hide the Bible was putting the Bible in, in Latin language, which Latin language only the, the educated, right, and the leaders of the church that understand the Latin language. Now, another thing that comes into the church is papal supremacy, right, and papal supremacy basically refers to the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church that the Pope, by reason of his office as Vicar of Christ and as pastor of the entire Christian Church, has full supreme and universal power over the whole Church, a power which he can always exercise and endured that in brief the Pope enjoyed by divine institution supreme, full, immediate and universal power in the care of souls. So this was what papal supremacy is. Right, the papacy is supreme, the Pope is supreme, he has supreme authority on the earth over the whole church because he is vicar of Christ. What that means is Jesus Christ on earth. And so, let's go back to the definition of Antichrist one who opposes God, one who also put himself in the place of God, and put himself in the place of Christ. Right, that's anti-Christian. Now, there was a decree that goes out from Justinian. Now, in 533, Justinian declared the Pope to be the, the leader and the ruler of the Christian church in all the world. And that the, the church at Rome was supposed to be the corrector of heresies. But... Justinian had a problem. Um, the emperor at Rome had a problem. And the problem was the Ostrogoths and the Vandals. But in 534, Justinian army managed to destroy the Vandals. But the Ostrogoths, over time, start to occupy um, in Rome. Right? And so because the Astrogoths were there, the decree of Justinian could not go out in full. And so it was 538 when the Astrogoths left Rome. They were pretty much defeated by Justinian. That the, the, the Pope of Rome, the papacy, the Roman Church, right, get its full authority. That was 538 AD. Right? When Vigilius Right, ascended the papal chair under the military protection of Belsirius. And so from that time, the church at Rome, right, 
with, with full authority, full supremacy in our mind, goes out to correct anyone that does not adhere to our teachings. And a lot of times, these teachings were pagan teachings. The Pope ascension to our claiming of um, supreme power over, over the church, right, is anti biblical. Right? When you look at 1 Peter 2.25, it says, For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of our, of your souls. So Christ is the bishop of our souls. Christ is the leader of the church when you read us through in the scripture. But papal supremacy says that the Pope is the head of the church. Now, there were a lot of other errors that comes into the church, right? Like Easter, we know Easter coming to the church. It's a pagan tradition. We know that idolatry comes into the church. Um, praying for the dead, right? purgatory, limbo, indulgences, um, relics. Christmas, salvation by good works, right? Mass, right? Which was a blasphemous feast, right? And I asked the question, can you think of any other errors that, that had come into the church um, in, these, in those times, in the time of the third, third seal, right? It would be good to know. So just comment in the comment section. Now, the portion of the third seal prophecy says, Earth not the oil and the wine. We look at what the oil and the wine symbolize the last time. We look at the fact that the oil symbolizes the Holy Spirit and that the wine symbolizes Christ's blood being shed for us. Right? The earth not the oil and wine tells us that the Holy Spirit would still remain in the church doing his work and that salvation by jesus christ's death would remain would remain and as a fundamental teaching in the church there were persons right who were faithful in the church and this is why the holy spirit remained right and this is why salvation in the name of christ remained in jude the scripture admonished beloved when i gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye shall earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints right so that's Jude 3 right it tells that in time of apostasy God's people is to earnestly contend for the faith and in the time of the third seal apostasy 313 AD to 1500 AD, right? There were persons who earnestly contend for the faith, right? And the question is, who were these faithful ones? And this is what we're going to look at right here. Now, in Great Controversy, chapter 4, it says, Amid the gloom, that's gloom that settled upon the earth during the long period of papal supremacy, the light of truth could not be wholly extinguished. In every age, there were witnesses for God. Men who cherish faith in Christ as the only mediator between God and man, who held the Bible as the only rule of life, and who allowed the true Sabbath. How much the world owed to these men, posterity will never know. They were branded as heretics, their motives impugned, and their characters maligned, their writings suppressed, misrepresented, or mutilated. Yet they stood firm and from age to age maintained their faith in its purity as a sacred heritage for the generations to come. Right? Now, the church in Ireland, the Irish Christians, right? It says, From Ireland came the pious Columba and his co laborers who gathering about them, the scattered believers on the lonely island of Iona, made this the center of their missionary labors. Among these evangelists was an observer of the Bible Sabbath. And thus this truth was introduced among the people. A school was established at Iona from which missionaries went out, not only to Scotland and England, 
but to Germany, Switzerland, and even Italy. Right? So the Irish Christians still remain faithful. The Abyssinian Church, or the church in Ethiopia, says, in lands beyond the jurisdiction of Rome, there exist for many centuries bodies of Christians who remain almost wholly free from papal corruption. They were surrounded by Edenism in the lapse of ages were affected by its error. But they continue to regard the Bible as the only rule of faith and adhere to many of its truths. These Christians believe in the perpetuity of the law of God and observe the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment. Churches that held to this faith and practice exist in Central Africa and among the Armenians of Asia. Right? So the Armenian Christians and the church um, in Central Africa. Now another group that remained faithful to God during this dark period, this period of apostasy, right, 313 AD to 1500 AD, the third seal, right, the Waldensians, oh, the Waldensians. So the faith which for centuries was held and taught by the Waldensian Christians was in marked contrast to the false doctrines put forth from Rome. Their religious belief was founded upon the written word of God, the true system of Christianity. But those humble peasants in their obscure retreats shut away from the world and bound to daily toil among their flocks and their vineyards had not by themselves arrived at the truth in opposition to the dogmas and heresies of the apostate church. There was not a faith newly received. Their religious beliefs was the, their inheritance from their fathers. They contended for the faith of the apostolic church, the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, the church in the wilderness, and not the proud hierarchy enthroned in the world great capital, was the true church of Christ, the guardian of the treasures of truth which God had committed to his people to be given to the world. Right? So all these Christian bodies that I've looked at a while ago, they were the ones right who were keeping alive right the word of god the teachings of christ in the church and this is why the holy spirit was there and this is why righteousness by faith christ dying to save us from our sins were still in the church they keep the flames alive and they are primarily the reason right that under the fourth and fifth seal they were primarily the reason why the Reformation comes about, right, to reform the church from its apostasy and errors that it was sunken into. Now, in our next study, right, we will be looking at the fourth seal. Um, and the fourth seal tells that it has gotten so bad because of the apostasies over the century um, that the church was dying right it promised to be an interesting study you don't want to miss it right you don't want to miss it john chapter 8 states when you know the truth the truth will make you free so from now until we meet the next time god be with you and be blessed